Okay, I think most have joined. So good evening. Um, my name is Louise King. I'm your presenter this evening. Welcome to our webinar on special lenses, astigmatism and callisto. Our expert um, presenter is consultant ophthalmic surgeon, Mr. Jonathan Aboshia. And this presentation will be followed by a Q&A session. If you'd like to ask a question during or after this presentation, please do so by using the Q&A icon, which is at the bottom of your screen. This can be done with or without giving your name. Please note this session is being recorded if you do provide your name. If you'd like to book your consultation, we'll provide contact details at the end of this se session. I'll now hand over to Mr. Jonathan Aboshia and you'll hear from me again shortly. Thank you. Thanks, Louise. Um, hello, everyone. I hope you can all hear me well. Um, yeah, thanks for joining this evening. We're just going to go through a few topics that might be of interest to anyone who is considering having cataract surgery, particularly if you're thinking about coming to Benenden as a bits of equipment and some techniques that are um, pretty unique, at least uh, in my experience in the NHS, uh, that Benenden has some state-of-the-art equipment, which is partly what we're going to talk about, and also a little bit about what that's useful for and how that might affect your choices for uh, lenses to replace your cloudy lens, which is your cataract, which we take out during the operation. So a little bit about me, um, study medicine at Cambridge, went to Australia for a few years, ended up doing brains for a bit and then got into eyes. Spent most of my training when I got back at Moorfields was a consultant briefly um, and done some research there. My PhD was at UCL, which is affiliated with Moorfields. Um, and I've done some other training um, above and beyond uh, the average cataract and corneal training. I've done a couple of fellowships and um, a few thousand procedures now. Time rolls by. So uh, in this session, we're going to cover cataract surgery uh, in its basic forms, astigmatism, what that is, and how, what we need to do to correct it, uh, toric intraocular lenses and EDOF stroke multifocal lenses. So EDOF is extended depth of focus lenses, and they are different to multifocal lenses. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, something called capsulorexis, which is a nice Greek term, and a product that we use here for our operating um, called the Callisto operating microscope. So obviously cataract surgery and eye surgery is very fiddly and we use an operating microscope and the one we use here is a very state-of-the-art uh, product that I will talk a little bit more in depth about later on. And then a little bit at the end about our eye unit and as we said then a question and answer session. So cataracts, what are they? Well cataract is uh, another word for cloudiness, of the lens inside the eye. I think it comes from an old term for waterfall. Um, I think back uh, many thousands of years ago, people thought that there was water in the eye, which isn't entirely untrue, actually. It's probably about 90, 98% of the eye cavity is water. And that when it became cloudy, it was a bit like water babbling over a brook. And instead of clear water, it was white and opaque. And that's why we call it a cataract. So the eye, or the diagram you can see on the left, is your eye or anyone's eye or a schematic of it um, cut in half looking from the side and what you can see is um, uh, the front of the eye there's something called the cornea and that's really the front clear covering of the eye and then behind that is your iris and the iris is the color part of the eye that gives people their eye color to do with melanin which is the same thing that gives us a skin color and then sitting behind the hole in the middle of the iris which is called the pupil uh, which is the black uh, hole that you see, um, is the lens. And the natural lens is made up of little proteins, uh, very, very carefully organized proteins, because as you can tell from everything else in your body, it's quite unusual for biological material to be transparent. So these tiny little proteins called crystallins have a very, very, very highly ordered short range um, geometry, and that enables the wavelengths of light to go through the lens without being scattered. Um, as we get older or for other reasons such as injury, diabetes and so forth, um, the short range order of these tiny little proteins is disrupted and uh, they start to scatter light. They don't allow this light to pass through the lens so clearly and that is what we call a cataract. So a cataract is a cloudiness of your natural lens that exists inside the eye. The big cavity or um, space inside the eye there is called the vitreous humor and that's basically water it's about 98 percent water and then if you think of the eye as a camera you've got your lens at the front which comprises your cornea and your natural lens and then you've got your photographic film at the back of the eye which is this 
yellow line and that is your retina and that converts the photons of light into electrical signals which go off through the optic nerve to your brain. In order to see clearly, you need to have a clear cornea, a clear lens and a functioning and well-working retina. And then all of that needs to go off through some clever electronics into your brain and be processed by the parts of your brain that enable us to perceive vision as well as just sense it. So it's quite a complicated little bit of kit we've got, but normally works very well. One of the most common things that makes it not work so well is a cataract. Now, a cataract is not a disease. It happens to all of us as we get older. Some of us are a bit younger than others. Uh, it's a bit like saying a wrinkles are a disease. It is just part of growing up. So um, you haven't got a disease in having it. However, it is a condition that uh, does have a great impact on our daily life if it stops us seeing well, because we're very visual creatures. About a third of our brain input from everything in our body, from our taste and our sense and our smell, about a third of everything is uh, just vision. So we are very, very visual creatures and we do notice it when our vision declines. So the cataracts uh, can affect the vision because they basically scatter light, as I was saying earlier. Uh, the light comes in because here and from the left gets focused probably about two thirds of the focusing power is in the cornea actually not the lens but the clever thing about the natural lens we're born with is it changes shape so you can focus in the distance and you can focus up close when that clear lens becomes cloudy i.e a cataract everything becomes a bit blurry one of the first things we can notice is a bit of glare that's a very common symptom of cataract also because of the density of the lens as we get older, we can also notice our glasses become more and more short-sighted or our glasses prescription. Uh, in fact, normally the safest way to correct that is just with new glasses, but at some point, regardless of what glasses you put in front of the eye, you will not see clearly because the lens inside the eye is cloudy. And that's normally the time at which we would suggest cataract surgery is something to think about. What is astigmatism? So you can see in the diagram on the left, the cornea, which is the clear front surface of the eye. In this diagram, which is beautifully drawn, it is you know, a semicircle. It's obviously um, uh, just a cartoon of a real eye. None of us are perfect. We're not made of machines. And therefore, we always have a bit of asymmetry in our finger length and our ear height and so forth. And, and our eyes also are not normally perfectly round, or at least half of a football. You can see here that if you were to cut a football in half or even look at the side of a football, the red line, the curvature of the vertical red line, or what we call a meridian, that line of curvature, would be exactly the same curvature as the horizontal blue line. And, and that would be completely spherical. That would be a non-toric sort of surface. And I'll tell you what uh, toric means in a moment. But basically, toric is another word for a lens that corrects astigmatism. It has different powers in, the, in two perpendicular planes, normally the vertical and horizontal, but not always vertical and horizontal. So an eye with no astigmatism is as steep a curvature in any direction like a football. Most eyes have a bit of astigmatism, and that's best thought of a bit like a rugby ball, where you can imagine a rugby ball in your hand, or American football in this case, that the curvature, the red line, the vertical meridian, is a steeper curvature than the curvature of the blue line or the horizontal meridian. So astigmatism is where, if you want to think of it in the simplest terms, the front of your eye is a bit more rugby ball shaped than perfectly round football shaped. Why does that matter? Well, beyond a certain amount of astigmatism, it actually blurs the vision. And that means that you would need something to correct astigmatism. And we'll go on to what that something might be sooner or later. So if you have a lot of astigmatism and you just replace the cloudy lens inside the eye with a perfectly, what we would, let's say for argument's sake, round lens inside the eye, then you will still have the astigmatism that might be in the cornea at the front of the eye that would need correction some way or other. So some of you might have encountered astigmatism before in your glasses prescription from your optician. It might look something like this. You'll have a number at the front, say minus two or plus two or minus 1.5, something like that. And that just tells you whether the eye in general is long sighted i.e. you can see well in the distance but has struggles seeing up close or is short-sighted, i.e. you can see pretty well up close but struggles to see in the distance. If you have no what we call refractive error, then you would just have a prescription of zero and of course you wouldn't have glasses. However, as we get older, beyond the age of about 45, we also lose the ability, as I mentioned earlier, of that lens to change shape. 
and so we find it harder and harder to see things as they come closer towards us so we end up needing reading glasses those of you who have some astigmatism in your glasses prescription will notice that there are not just one number which might be plus for long sighted and minus for short sighted but there's a second number and here that number is is three again the plus and the minus just refer to the the strength of the lenses whether they're positive or negative um, that second number is what determines or the, the, the degree of astigmatism that your glasses are correcting. And you'll see after that number, there is a little cross and then 90 degrees. And that's because if you remember the rugby ball, a rugby ball has an angle at which it is. A football is just round and whichever way you move it, it's the same roundness everywhere. A rugby ball obviously has, say, the pointy bits. And they can be at that angle, at that angle, at that angle, at that angle. So the, 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 the issue with astigmatism is there isn't what we call an axis to the astigmatism. Um, and that's the orientation along which the cornea might be steeper or less steep than, say, perpendicular 90 degrees to that. So when you get your prescription, you see two numbers. Uh, the second number after a, a forward slash, that means you've got some astigmatism. Um, and you can always check that with your um, optician's prescription. The glasses astigmatism, which is what we were just talking about, is also sometimes called cylinder, it's just another name for that type of astigmatism. And it's to correct the combined astigmatism of the natural lens and the cornea. I was saying earlier that the cornea is not normally perfectly symmetrical, like a football made in a factory and has some astigmatism, but that also applies to your natural lens. Most of us, again, we have a natural lens that isn't perfectly symmetrical, and there may be a bit of astigmatism in the lens itself. The astigmatism of the lens and the cornea combine to give your glasses astigmatism. That's what they're trying to correct the astigmatism in the entire eye. When we do cataract surgery, we, we take out the natural lens. So that means we're also removing any contribution of the natural lens to the eye's total astigmatism. And what we've got left then is the corneal astigmatism. And we measure that in the clinic in ways that are different to how it's measured here by your optician. And sometimes people say, oh, well, I've got, you're telling me I've got much more astigmatism, but in my glasses, I don't have very much at all, or vice versa. My optician said, I have a lot of astigmatism and you're telling me I, I don't. And, and that's because all we're doing for surgery is measuring the corneal astigmatism because we're going to by definition remove the astigmatism contribution of your natural cloudy lens or the cataract so what do we do with the remaining corneal astigmatism well we can correct it there's always a simple answer with glasses or almost always nothing is always a medicine unfortunately but almost always you can just correct it with glasses but of course then you have to wear glasses and astigmatism will blur the vision especially if it's significant for all distances so that would probably mean wearing glasses for seeing things in the distance uh, intermediate which is maybe about half a meter um, and for near which is a, maybe uh, about a foot so if you have a lot of astigmatism or significant corneal astigmatism you, you, the doctor may offer you something called a toric lens and all the toic means is that it will try and correct the astigmatism that's in the cornea by counteracting that with some correction inside the lens implant or what's called an intraocular lens implant or IOL, which goes inside the eye. And you can see that on the right here. And the aim of that is to try and give you better vision without your glasses. So that's what toric lenses do. And that's at all distances. Now, it doesn't mean you will be able to see at all distances because, of course, if you have a monofocal toric lens, that will correct the astigmatism for distance. But the monofocal bit means there's one focal point and that's almost always set for distance. So you might need a cheap pair of reading glasses. But again, the benefit of having a toric monofocal lens would, be, would mean that your distance vision should be pretty good without your glasses and you don't have to have a toric or astigmatism correction in your reading glasses which means you can just get a sort of um, buy off the shelf pair from wherever you go for those about one in five people have significant corneal astigmatism we normally define that as above 1.5 diopters the d just means diopters and it's the same units that we saw in that previous example of plus three and minus two and whatever your prescription is they're always in units called diopters or D for short. And normally, if that second number is above 1.5, then 
that is likely to have reasonably significant effect on the vision such that you won't have very clear vision unless it's somehow corrected. And that would either be with glasses or if you're trying to get rid of your glasses from a toric intraocular lens, which is put in to replace the cloudy lens that's taken out during your surgery. Now, those little rings are uh, trying to highlight something that might be a little bit subtle on the screen, which is that this lens, because it's a toric lens, has some little dots, which you can see three dot vertical dots inside each of those red circles. And that goes back to the point about the rugby ball having an orientation and the axis of the astigmatism. We have to align those dots very carefully with the axis of the astigmatism of the cornea. So we have to find what angle we need to put the lenses in. And um, that's really, really important. Otherwise, you don't get the healing effect or the, the corrective effect of the, of the toric lens to counteract the astigmatism in the cornea. So the aim of this is to try and reduce your need for glasses or even get rid of your need for glasses. So the options for people who have significant astigmatism normally above about one and a half is what we call significant. That's corneal astigmatism. So you wouldn't necessarily know you have that until you um, have your assessment with us or wherever you go, because the, um, the measurements that are done are not typically done in the opt opt opticians. So you can have, as I just described, a toric monofocal lens that corrects astigmatism for distance, should give you good unaided distance vision, but you'll need a pair of readers for near vision and possibly for intermediate vision. So that's again about reading distance for near and intermediate is about computer or dashboard when you're driving. Another option, the next sort of stage up would be something called a toric EDOF lens. So EDOF is extended depth of focus. Uh, there, every choice in medicine has a has an up and a downside. So the upsides of the EDOF is they give you good unaided distance vision and also intermediate vision. So that might be using a computer on your desk or driving and looking at your dashboard. They give you better depth of focus than a standard monofocal lens, but you probably still will need glasses for near vision if you're reading um, small print on your phone or the newspaper and so forth. They're not designed for that. Some people do get away with EDOF lenses that give them near vision, but that's not what we, we say they do. And then the sort of um, next level up to try and get as spectacle independent as possible is a toric multifocal lens. And um, the aim of that is to get you out of your glasses. So you wouldn't need glasses for your distance or for intermediate or for near. Um, that's it. So the other thing just to be aware of is I mentioned this number of 1.5, but for multifocal lenses and, and to a lesser degree for extended depth of focus or EDOF lenses, we need to correct the astigmatism more carefully. So even if your corneal astigmatism is less than 1.5, if you were going for an EDOF or a multifocal lens, you may find that we would recommend a toric version of those lenses to correct any sort of astigmatism because the lenses work best when there's a minimal amount of astigmatism left in the cornea which is you know, maximally corrected by the lenses. So I mentioned before that we need to align them. Why do we need to align them? Well, when we're lying down and then when we sit up, most people's eyes rotate a few degrees, maybe three to five degrees rotating as we sit up. Now, that also changes between people. So some people might rotate one way, some people might rotate another way, some people's eyes might rotate quite a lot, other people's eyes would rotate very little. But what we do need to do is find a way to, because you're most of the time looking when you're sitting up, we need to find a way of marking the axis that the lens needs to go on when you're sitting up. However, we haven't yet worked out a way to operate when you're sitting up although I think lots of patients would like it. But um, yeah, we still need to get you to lie flat on a, on a couch when we're doing the operation. And of course, then the eye rotates. So there's a, an issue there about how do we make sure we're aligning it to the correct axis when you're sitting up, given that when we're measuring it, you're lying down. And so traditionally what we do is we mark it with ink when you're sitting up in the pre-op room and then you lie down and uh, we know where the marks are for when you're sitting up. Um, what Benedin has invested uh, uh, quite heavily in is, is a state-of-the-art microscope called the Callisto. And what that does is use a head-up display for the surgeon to perfectly align the toric lens. So that allows the surgeon to align the axis 
um, orientation of the toric lens to correct the astigmatism perfectly because with every x number of degrees you're off axis you lose some of the corrective power uh, of the toric lens and what you want to do is have it you know corrected as as you you expect to really reduce the astigmatism down to a negligible amount um th these uh, head-up displays are pretty cool things when you see them the, the picture at the bottom is just one in a plane actually came i think originally from spitfire um gun site was kind of the most primitive one but really it was in the 60s there was a plane called the buccaneer and it was meant to carry nuclear munitions and these pilots were flying very very low very very fast and, and maybe would only see the the target for a you know, fraction of a second and so they didn't have time to look up to a bomb site look down to their instruments um so that's when i think that was one of the first planes if not the first plane to have something called a head-up display which I'm, I'm sure people have seen in tv programs and movies but it's it's based on the same principle that you know if the eye moves a little bit the surgeon always has the exact uh, angle to put these lenses on you can see those on the top screen there's three blue lines and that's telling you where to align the the lens as you put it in and it actually moves with the eye and it also tracks the the eye as it rotates between lying down and standing up so when you have your pre-assessment the computer talks to the microscope um, and actually says this is what the eye is aligned when 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 you're sitting up and that's what we want to know and it actually accounts for that for when you're lying down the surgeon's looking down the microscope so it's a very very clever bit of kit and um you know there are not that many places i did a bit of research and work out i think it's less than 15 percent of our units in the uk have this technology um and that's, that's mainly because um you know the obviously the nhs is not providing toric lenses uh, in the ways that it used to and also it's, it's a very uh, expensive bit of kit but it's a it's a great piece of kit to work with for the surgeons because we're very reassured um that patients are getting the absolute best service and that we are um aligning those lenses absolutely perfectly to correct the astigmatism so just to run over a little bit of cataract surgery you might have seen this if you saw my last talk uh, it takes about 10 to 15 minutes on average, sometimes a bit quicker, sometimes a bit longer. We make little incisions in the cornea, which is the clear part of the front. We do the capsulorexis, um, which uh, is variably spelt because of two R's or one R from the Greek. I'll talk about that in a second. Then you'll hear a little bit of noise, a buzzing noise, and that's the phaco emulsification. That's the ultrasound probe that goes in to break up the cloudy lens uh, into little pieces, a bit like when you play Trivial Pursuit and you're sort of always say it's the opposite of that you're not trying to put all the little segments into the pie you're trying to break it up into little segments and, and, and end up with an empty cartridge so then you hear a bit of uh, irrigation aspiration that's just water going in and out of the eye more noise and then probably the most interesting bit from anyone undergoing the procedure is when the lens goes in that's a bit of the light show the lens is rolled up like a little taco and as it unfolds you get this lovely kaleidoscope effect then we put some antibiotics inside the eye um, seal up the wounds and we cover the eye with a transparent shield. So you can see here some of the steps that I was just talking about. Uh, the capsular rexus just is a uh, rexus, I think is Greek for tearing or ripping a little hole. It's a little bit more precise than that in the very, very thin membrane that contains the natural lens, which is called the capsule. So people sometimes ask, how does the new lens stay in place? Well, it stays in place the same way the old lens did. It goes into this very, very thin transparent bag called the capsule. And that's the fiddly bit of the surgery. Then, as I said, there's the phaco tip, which is breaking up the cloudy lens, um, which we call the cataract with the ultrasound energy. And then you can see a little diagram of the folded up lens going into the eye, and then it unfolds. And voila, you can see again. So the capsulorexis um, is making it open in a very, very thin transparent bag. It's it's eye surgeons always you know like to brag that the only surgeons that operate on the basement membrane that it's so thin it's the it's the layer that cells sit on it's about one thousandth of an inch or less than that um it really 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 is a very tiny thing and and adding to its uh, smallness is the fact it's transparent so it's probably the fiddliest bit of the surgery um and you're trying to make an opening in the front of that bag um, it's called variably a capsule or a bag. That's just the, 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 the thin membrane that contains the cloudy lens. You need to make sure it's circular, it's central, and it's the correct size, the three Cs. So normally, we just, a terrible pun here, eyeball that diameter of the opening at 5.5 millimeters. Now you can imagine trying to eyeball, you obviously get better with it with experience, but uh, you know, eyeballing the difference between five and six millimeters 
is um you know that that that's a, a an acquired skill and um uh, there, there are better ways to do it and i'll come on to that in a moment so one of the times it can be quite hard is that as surgeons we do many many hundreds if not thousands of these procedures and so we get used to these things kind of a procedural memory but if the eye is particularly big or small um, and that's normally people who have, are short-sighted they have bigger than average eyes or long-sighted they have smaller than average eyes then you normally say oh well, it's about so far away from the iris and I, I judge that's about 5.5 but that can be quite misleading if someone has a very big eye or a very small eye and uh, probably a few percent of people do have really really big or really really small eyes so how can we mitigate that problem uh, why do we, why would we want to well the reason is that little opening needs to be all of those things that i was talking about if it's too big or too small or off center or not circular that can cause problems that can increase the amount of cloudiness behind the lens it can cause the lens to sit off the center of the vision it can and that can have a particular effect if it's um, a multifocal lens or a toric lens uh, it can also cause if it's too small the membrane to start shrinking around that opening so you really want it to be the right size and before this kind of technology there were some instruments to try and help you do it but basically uh, uh, almost all surgeons were just um, you know judging it by uh, a kind of experience so What's improved now with this new microscope? Well, the Callisto microscope, again, using the head-up display, projects uh, an image, the perfect size and position of this capsular rexus. So you actually can be guided. So you set your parameters and you know you want to be, you want a 5.5 millimeter rexus. So you want to be making that opening in this very delicate clear membrane in between the blue circles. And again, if you as a patient move or um, uh, the surgeon has to move the microscope, those blue lines will track and always be in exactly the right place so that's really a game changer and super helpful for the surgeon to make sure that you have a really good outcome and the lens is exactly where it needs to be so no longer the need just to eyeball the eyeball that's my terrible pun for the presentation over so i'll hand over to louise just to let you know a little bit about um what we're doing at the eye unit um, unless you want me to talk that through louise um Yes, if you wouldn't mind, I think you're more of an expert than me. Okay, yeah, um, ju just to say um, that, uh, you know, I'm very proud to work at Benenden. I've been at some big hospitals and, um, you know, Benenden has a CQC outstanding rating, which is, um, you know, it's not easy to get. I think only about 8%, less than 10% of NHS acute core services have got that level rating. And it's it's just a lovely, friendly place. And I really enjoy working here. And I think all the patients I've I've treated here really enjoyed coming here it's a nice place to be and and everyone's happy and so I'm, I'm very proud to um you know toot that horn or blow the banner or whatever whatever the phrase is so yeah it's it's a really lovely place to be and I think that's really important for everyone to be happy it's very supportive and and you're not you're not a number you're not processed you're, you're a person it's kind of how I remember the best bits of the NHS 20 years ago um obviously we do a, a medical and social history just to ask uh, the details we need for the uh, procedure to go ahead. We check some basic things like your blood pressure and what your vision's like and the pressure in your eye. There are some other uh, investigations. So that biometry one is the one where we're measuring the astigmatism amongst many other things, including the size of your eye. And those are the main factors that go into deciding what power lens implant you need, because everybody needs a different strength lens for the shape and size of their eye. Um, we also do some other more advanced uh, scans, something called a pentacam, uh, which measures in great detail thousands and thousands of points at the front of your eye so that we can get a really good impression of what shape your eye might be and what kind of astigmatism, etc., you might need correcting. Because the thing is, whenever you measure anything in medicine, there's always some error. And so the more you can measure it and the better tools you have to measure it with, uh, the more you minimize that error. And we do a scan called an OCT scan, which is basically an ultrasound with light over the back of the eye the retina to make sure that photographic film is healthy um, you'll then uh, have all of that done by the team here and then you'll come in and see one of the consultants um, um, i think there's three of us now that are doing these lenses uh, at benedon um, we'll talk to you about the results of the scans what lenses might be a good idea for you what lenses might not because it's not the case that everybody should or can have a multifocal or a toric lens uh, everyone's different it's, it's so it's surprising somebody said once that you get bored of doing Cataracts, but it's really quite remarkable how different everyone's eyes are for, for essentially the same organs. 
So we then talked to you about the results, talked to you a, bit, a little bit about the surgery, tell you about the risks. Unfortunately, you have to do that um, as part of life. But, you know, it is incredibly safe surgery. It's one of the, you know, not many operations in, in medicine have 98, 99 percent success rates. So I would just uh, but that's partly because we're so meticulous in, in, in measuring everything before we, we go ahead and start the operation. Then we have a chat with you about the type of lens implants and um, what you want to do. A big part of cataract surgery, you know, in the old days, it was about making sure you could see it, some, you know, somehow, whether that's with the glasses or contacts or whatever. Now, a lot of it is about, you know, asking people what they want from it. You know, do, do they like orienteering and it really frustrates them every time they look down at a map, they've got water on their glasses, those sort of things. So that's called the refractive outcome. It's, you know, what do you want to be able to see um, without your glasses or with your glasses and where do you want your focusing to be so that's really where cataract surgery has moved into rather than just safely removing the lens but you know leaving you with a, a huge prescription in your glasses uh, and then we talked to you about consent you sign the consent form and then you get booked in for surgery um, it's a little bit quicker uh, just the way of things if you are going down this, what we call the special lens route and that would include anything from a toric mo monofocal which is just correcting astigmatism all the way through the EDOFs and the multifocals, which may or may not have a toric correction in them as well. Um, and of course, we've got a really good support team and a 24 hour phone line afterwards uh, if you have any questions or concerns. So I think that's me done. Sorry if I rabbited too quickly. Um, I will hello, hand hello. over to Louise for the QA. Thank you. That was really interesting. I don't think you were too quick at all. Um, we have some questions to go through. Um, the first is someone says they've been considering cataract surgery but heard that you wouldn't be able to get them done if you've had laser eye surgery in the past. Is this true? Uh, not true. It's definitely something to be aware of. So um, laser eye surgery is increasingly common and one of the things it does is we have to use mathematical formulae to predict where your focus will be after the cataract surgery. And that's how we decide what power of lens. So you, you put in all these parameters into the, into the machine, uh, say the, the length of your eye, the curvature of your cornea, the depth of the front of the eye, the thickness of the lens, lots of different things. And they all go into lots of different formulae, mathematical formulae. And, and then we work out what's the most likely lens to give you focus at where you want. Um, when you've had laser eye surgery, say to correct, remove your glasses, something like LASIK is a common one. It, the presuppositions that go into that formula are less uh, secure. And what I mean by that is the chances that you'll be spot on for the focus afterwards are less. It doesn't. So lots of people have cataract surgery, but, you, you know, if you've had laser, what we call laser vision correction in the past, they're often young people who are very short sighted. They say, I don't want to wear my glasses and they have laser vision correction, uh, either laser with a flap or without a flap, then you just have to be aware the predictability of, of focus is not as accurate. It's still pretty accurate and there are good formulae that account for that. But the most important thing is you must tell the surgeon and the team that you see that you've had laser. The only, the, the real big surprises happen when people say, no, 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 I've never had laser. And then you do it and then they get a kind of surprise. And then they said afterwards, oh, actually, yeah, I did. I did have that thing 10 years ago to 20 years ago to remove my need for glasses. So just let them know there are things we can do to um, uh, accommodate people who've had laser vision correction. But we need to know. And the, the other thing that's really important is to work out whether you had it to uh, correct what's called myopia or hyperopia. That means long sighted, short sightedness or long sightedness. So the easiest question is, you know, before you had it, were you trying to see better in the distance? And then you had the laser and you could see well in the distance without your glasses. So we'd, you, you would need to know um, if at all possible, the laser vision correction was done to correct short sightedness or long sightedness. Okay. Thank you. OK, um, if a patient is nervous, can they be anaesthetized during eye surgery? Or if not, can any other kind of medication be given to sedate a very nervous patient? That's a good, uh, good question. So everyone's got some everyone's anaesthetized to a degree because the, we do it under something called a local anesthetic and that means that in the old days when i started i was on lists where every single person was you know put under a general anesthetic but there there are there are risks to that in of itself and it's not the most efficient way or pleasant way to do it so most all the surgery here we do is under local anesthetic and that means drops 
on the eye, like when you come for your examination, and then little injection inside the eye, which you don't notice apart from a bit of stinging. And that works really, really well for people. They don't have any horrible hangover from general anaesthetic. Um, you, we can give sedation. We can give a tablet here at Benenden, and that normally calms people down a little bit. We don't do it routinely for everyone because the issue with sedation is some people can react. It's a bit like having a little dram of uh, whiskey or something. You know, some people have an empty stomach and you're affected. It can make you, you know, away with the fairies. And when you're having uh, an operation under a local anaesthetic and the, the doctor says, OK, turn to the left or stop moving or look up, you need to be able to comply, as it were, or, um, you know, do, do what's asked of you. So if you're really nervous, most people, almost everybody I've ever operated on has said, it's it was worse thinking about it than having it done and the best thing is not to think about what's having done you just say i'm on the beach i always tell people i'm on the beach i'm looking through a hat at the sun or go to a happy place but we 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 do give out um some oral sedation here for people who are really really anxious um and it's just uh it's just something we can do if you ask for it so if you, if you feel you need it and you really are terrified then um just ask when you're here uh, and they can do that for you um, is it the patient's choice to have either the monofocal EDOF or the multifocal lens, or is it the surgeon's recommendation? Everything is the patient's choice. So that's the, the paternalistic model of medicine is gone. So even even uh, whether you have surgery or not, you know, uh, that's that's another thing I found is that oh, I've been told by X that I need a cataract operation. Y you need it when you feel, because they're your eyes and you live with the consequences, that you feel that you'll benefit. Um, most people, occasionally there are people who say you need it for, you know, you really should have it done. But there are some people who are terrified of surgery um, and there are other people who have what we think is completely normal vision and, and they still want cataract surgery. So it's a choice for every person to make individually. There are some eyes where they wouldn't be suitable for multifocal lenses and that's why we do a quite in-depth workup um, or even occasionally for Torix, it's quite unusual. Um, so we would always advise you what we think are suitable options and then you choose from them. That would be the, the proper way to do it. Okay. Relating to that, I've actually had a question. Um, someone's had a detached retina a few years ago. Would they be able to go for the toric multifo multifocal lens? Uh, yeah, that's a good that's a, a good question. So, um, yeah, you can. There's no reason inherently not to do that. If you've got a fair bit of astigmatism and you want it corrected, um, detached retinas can happen spontaneously. I don't know if... That, what happened with your case it's a very unlikely but possible side effect of any cataract surgery so we tell you about the risks and benefits of that and what to look out for but as long as your um, retinal detachment repair went well and you can see well then there's no reason not to have a toric lens to correct if you've got a fair bit of astigmatism so yeah there's no there's no reason not to not to have that corrected afterwards okay um, had a couple of questions around driving. How soon can you drive after the operation? Ah, excellent question. So yeah, um, <laughs> legally you can drive when you can read a number plate at 20 meters. We would probably, we normally advise people for a week or two afterwards don't to do that, but partly because the eye is still healing and most of the time we don't put stitches in the, in the wounds anymore, they just self-heal. But if you were to be sort of shunted really hard or had a whiplash or something like that, it, it's probably not worth driving for the first week or two. So normally we, we advise people not to do that just for a couple of weeks after the surgery, just to allow the eye to, it's more of a peace of mind thing. Okay. Um, what level of intraocular pressure would make the procedure difficult? Uh, there's no, it's a, it's a shades of gray thing. So above a pressure of something called of 21 is considered abnormal, but many people might have a pressure of 22, 23, and that's incidental even high 20s some people aren't treated if you had a really high pressure then you would need to go and be assessed by a glaucoma specialist and glaucoma is the condition where you have a high pressure in the eye and over time that wears away on the optic nerve at the back of the eye and you lose your peripheral visual field so if you've got high pressure um the best thing is first of all to get that checked out by eye pressure specialists or somebody they're called glaucoma specialists and they will start you when I drop to lower the pressure um, one of the good things about cataract surgery is in the medium to long term it does actually lower your pressure a little bit but it can put the pressure up in the first few weeks afterwards partly because of the drops and so if you came here and you had a particularly high pressure we would probably ask for you to be reviewed by a glaucoma specialist to make a decision about whether you had glaucoma or not and if you needed treatment before we then went on 
and um, had a chat with you about what lenses you wanted in your cataract surgery. Okay. Thank you. Just a few more. Um, this person's had their assessment and they went for an ordinary lens. They were told they had an astigmatism and now thinking maybe they should have gone for a toric lens. Can they change their mind? I assume yeah. they can change that this is before they've had it, I assume. <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, that's what I'm not sure about. Yeah, so if you've had the lens put in, then it's tricky. I mean, it, it, you can do anything you want. As I said before, there's always a, every, everything's possible in medicine, uh, fortunately and unfortunately. Um, but, uh, you know, whether it's a good idea, it's quite risky removing lenses once because they're folded up in this little taco shape and they unfold. You've got to kind of either refold them or cut them. And they're a risk to that, especially if they've been in the eye for a while. So if you already had the surgery, I, I probably wouldn't advise doing it. If you've been into the, um, and there are other things you might be able to do, but if you've just been into the clinic and said, oh, I'd have the standard one. Um, and then you feel actually, I kind of would rather have the, the toric. I always advise people, you know, you, you you have the result of this the rest of your life. So it's always worth just going. We have special lens clinics here just to talk it through with somebody. Um, and then, you know, the options uh, and then, you know, people tend to feel a bit happier when they've known all the options and said, OK, that's for me. You might still say, no, I don't want the toric, but at least you've discussed it through the pros and the cons. And then you don't have that position where, you know, I've seen that with a couple of people who've, you know, weren't really told in the NHS that multifocal lenses were possible. Um, and then they've had the standard lenses and then um, they've seen a neighbor or a friend sort of, you know, playing golf and doing their scorecard without glasses. And they said, you know, I didn't know that was an option. The, legally now, even in the NHS, you should be told of all the options of all lenses, even if they're not offered um, mm -hmm. and there is a cost to them. So I think it's worth, if you're thinking about it, you know, it doesn't cost you anything but a bit of time to come and have a chat. And then you can say, yeah, that's what I want to go for. Or no, I'll stick with the with the standard lenses. I believe this person was on the waiting list. So, yes, they can change them. Yes. Yeah, so if they're on the waiting list, then um, I mean, it, it's a bit difficult without me seeing because everyone's got a tiny or everyone's got a bit of astigmatism. But the question is um, whether it's enough to, to sort of start thinking about toric lenses and without looking at your degree of astigmatism, I wouldn't know. Um, it, I suppose if you want to be. 100% safe just get another appointment and worst case you'll come in and they'll say uh, no you, you don't need one mm. okay thank you um this person has and they have a cataract in one eye and apparently the other eye they've been told has 100% vision is it worth therefore considering cataract surgery yeah absolutely um yeah we normally only operate on eyes that have a problem um, that's sort of the, the medico legal um, indication for cataract surgery. It's normally when you as a patient say, look, my, my vision's blurry. And that may well happen in one eye many years before the other eye. So I think that's completely reasonable to do that. They're, they're, the, the only issue is if you're having multifocal lenses, um, because they can give you um, some halos and you might notice them more if your eyes are, if you're comparing one multifocal lens with a natural lens. Um, so sometimes that's a little bit of a I think around but you know many people do that as well and they're quite happy so definitely if you feel there's a problem with your eye it's worth doing the thing i also say is if you don't feel there's a problem with your eye don't have surgery and that's a silly thing for a surgeon to say but you know it's incredibly safe surgery but all surgery is a risk and, and i would never counsel a patient to have an operation when they say i've got no problems with my vision i've got no glare i've got no worries about anything I just doing it because someone told me I had cataract. Well, just, you know, it's, it's when you feel there's a visual problem. Most people um, who, who, who come here say, yeah, I've got blurry vision or glare. They're the two main problems. Yeah. But one eye is fine. Yeah, you can definitely do one eye. Um, do people need to be referred by the NHS or can they come directly? Uh, my understanding is if you're a Benenden member, you would have to get a referral through a GP, which is just to say that your local waiting time, yeah. which unfortunately is pretty easy now, given the state of the waiting list in the NHS. Mm -hmm. If you're a if you're a, a private, uh, you know, fully private patient, you, you know, either paying or or with your ins private insurers, then you can just um, you can just ring up the private uh, team at Benenden, and they will um, book you a, an appointment. Yeah, that's right. Um, this person says. Um, from the presentation they now understand why they need specs for reading their biggest problem is sunlight it's painful would an operation be possible to correct this yeah so that's the most common uh, uh, first sort of indication that you're getting a bit of cataract is, is this glare and that's because 
as those little proteins that are perfectly or uh, ordered in your clear lens start to sort of become less ordered through time, you know, just, just like getting wrinkles, they start to um, interfere with the light passing through and it starts to scatter more. So the biggest sort of example people notice normally is driving in the evenings or at night with the car headlights, although these new, um, I think it's Xenon headlights are just awful for all of us, I think. I mean, I prefer yeah. days of the halogens. Um, I actually, there's an option, it's funny to mention that, there's actually an option on the operating microscope to turn the very state-of-the-art microscope um, into a, a halogen effect light. And I've looked at both of them, one of them is horrific bright blue, and so I always turn it down into the kind of slightly softer candle light of the, of the, of the, of the halogen. But yeah, it, it, the glare is normally a sign that your cataracts are getting on, and, and, and that's a reasonable thing. And some people have 20-20 vision, and they have the surgery done for glare about probably about 10 years ago you weren't able to do that but the nhs and nice and and, and all people who look after the recommendations realized that you know just reading letters on a chart is not vision vision is many things and and if you've got what we call disabling glare or bothersome glare then that's a reason to do cataract surgery because that will get rid of that yeah okay thank you i'm just gonna we've got a couple more questions but i'm just gonna Go through one or two more and then if we don't get through all of yours we will answer afterwards just so you know a quick question can you do both eyes at the same time or do you do one at a time uh yeah very topical question yes you can so um i actually was uh, my old mentor was the president of the bilateral same day cataract society so <laughs> the reason we didn't do it historically is there was a risk there is a risk of, of a blinding infection which is probably about one in two thousand in cataract surgery so it's very very rare um the uh, the argument was, you know, back in the day when it wasn't that safe that, you know, if you had a blinding infection, which you probably won't know for the first week afterwards, you don't want that in both eyes. They've done quite a lot of studies. I mean, for example, it's been standard practice in Sweden for a long time. Over the pandemic, the NHS changed its mind and now uh, does do same day. It's called immediate sequential bilateral cataract surgery, but it's basically the same day cataract surgery. Now, here at Benedict, that's only for people who are having special lenses. It's still for the standard lenses for logistic reasons, you have to have one at a time because the standard lenses, people are pulled to different surgeons. Um, but for the special lenses, the surgeon you see in the um, in the clinic is the surgeon that will operate on you and you will have a discussion about whether you want it on the same day. And just to give you an idea of the risk, the risk of, of, a, of a blinding infection, both eyes is estimated at about one in a million. And uh, that is about three times higher there's a bit macabre to tell you this but three times higher than the risk of you being killed in a car crash on the way to your second eye operation so it exists um but it is very very small and and everything in life has a risk doing nothing has a risk doing two operations has a risk from driving to the second operation so it's something that we do here uh, it's increasingly being done in the nhs and it, it's certainly something that's ch that the, the mindset has changed um, over the last 10 years, but particularly over the pandemic, it's now something that's sort of universally accepted as safe. Um, just the final question now. Um, this person says they can't drive at night anymore because it's got so bad, but they have many years disease and they can't lay flat. Would they be able to be put to sleep for this? Uh, yes. So my commiserations, because my dad has many years as well, it's a horrible condition, um, you know, especially when you get the attacks. Uh, yeah, if you if you really can't lie flat at all, then I think the best thing for you would be to have it done under a general anaesthetic. However, that isn't something that Benedin does uh, for ophthalmology for eye uh, cataract surgery. Um, so uh, yeah, by all means, general anaesthetic, which is probably still about 5% of all the cataracts done on the NHS are general anaesthetic, uh, much less than it used to be. But there are people, people with dementia, people with certain conditions, and, and if you are really um unable to lie flat without being in discomfort it may be better to have that done uh, at the nhs hospitals uh, with a general anesthetic where you're asleep just go to sleep and you wake up right. and it's done <laughs> thank you um sorry if we didn't answer all of your questions um i believe you've all provided your name so we can answer yours via email afterwards if you haven't if you want to quickly provide your name um, if you'd like to discuss or book your consultation, our private patients team is available between 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. Monday to Friday. We're offering a discount for, for joining this session for the next seven days with the terms on the screen, which you'll be able to see. Um, you'll receive a short survey 
after this survey and um, after this presentation and for the next couple of days via email. I'd be grateful if you could spare a few minutes to let us have your feedback so it really helps improve the sessions. Our next webinars include sole shoulder surgery and podiatry. Um, you can visit our website to sign up and see the dates for those. Um, so just to finish up really, so on behalf of myself, Mr. Abashir, and our expert team at Bendon Hospital, I'd like to say thank you for joining us today and we hope to hear from you very soon. So thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you. Bye everyone, thanks for joining. All the thank best. You. Bye.